Now, it's not every day that you get half an hour to speak to a central bank governor. Well, we had the chance today because the South African Reserve Bank is celebrating 100 years of its uh, existence. I started by asking the governor, uh, obviously I congratulated him, and then asked him to go through the key milestones in the bank's history. It's been 100 years of uh, the South African Reserve Bank. It's a very special day for the bank today, celebrating those uh, 100 years. And we have a special guest uh, to join us uh, in those uh, celebrations. So salutations to you uh, from CNBC Africa and uh, Africa at large, Governor number 10. Congratulations, indeed, are in order on your 100-year journey. So I wanted to begin by giving you the time to celebrate your day by talking us through the key milestones in that journey since 1921. Well, um, the central bank is uh, uh, an institution in society that gets shaped by events and it also gets shaped by what the um, uh, society uh, actually tasked the institution uh, with. Uh, when the central bank was created, it was uh, in the aftermath of the war. And interestingly, you know, the uh, earlier generation of central banks, uh, the Swedish one, the Bank of England, they were created to finance the wars. We were created after the uh, World War I, but it was created also because we had to deal with a banking uh, crisis uh, here. Uh, in South Africa. And uh, at the time, the monetary policy framework that was there globally was that you had the gold standard. And uh, so the South African pound was uh, packed to the, value of, uh, to the value of gold. The gold standard collapsed. And when the gold standard collapsed, it was replaced with the uh, Bretton Woods uh, uh, system of exchange rate. The Bretton Woods system was Thus, a framework to manage exchange rates globally. The Bretton Woods system uh, uh, collapsed, and that was the end of fixed exchange rates and exchange rates. Currencies were allowed to float. Central banks had to uh, thus uh, come with framework. Uh, in the main, at the time, the preferred framework was uh, to look at money growth in monetary aggregates, including credit, and so uh, and so forth. And it was also in an environment after you have had fixed exchange rates and the Bretton Woods system had collapsed that you then had um, uh, inflation uh, that was rising and uh, uh, rampant. And in the late 70s and uh, the 80s, uh, central banks were all confronted with dealing with uh, uh, inflation and the uh, erosion of the, the, uh, the value of money. Mm. And uh, what you then had after those big fighting, inflation fighting credentials of central banks, in the case of the Fed under uh, Paul Volcker, um, uh, and the inflation fighting credentials of institutions such as the Deutsche Bundesbank, mm -hmm. the breakthrough came when uh, um, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand decided to adopt an inflation targeting framework, and that inflation targeting framework became a framework that with modifications was adopted by central banks uh, around the world. In 2000, the South African Reserve Bank itself adopted the inflation targeting uh, framework. And uh, when that happened, we were the 13th central bank to adopt the inflation uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, framework. Uh, there have been modifications to that inflation targeting framework. Mm. Uh, we used to have what was called an escape clause that when there is a shock, uh, we could um, uh, uh, invoke this loss and then uh, allow the economy to go through the shock and then reinstate, uh, come back, bring the inflation back into the target range and so forth. That was replaced with an explanation clause, which said that we must constantly explain why inflation is deviating from a, a target and also if it is within target, whether there is a likelihood that it might deviate from uh, deviate from a target. It is a framework that we have now been applying. That framework is this year, 21 years. Um, the other key milestone this year, by the way, mm -hmm. is that the Reserve Bank, like the South African Constitution, is celebrating 25 years of its independence because the South African Reserve Bank's mandate is now enshrined in the Constitution. And the Reserve Bank, although it had existed uh, before, yeah. 
the, it is the constitution that pronounced that the South African Reserve Bank shall be the central bank of the Republic uh, of South Africa. So that is where we are. Absolutely. And uh, so it's been a checkered history, no doubt, punctured by crises, as you have been describing. So I wanted to know where you would rank the current COVID crisis amongst the many crises that the bank has faced over the years. This is probably, um, among central banks, there is general agreement. Mm. Uh, this is the worst uh, crisis since the uh, 1918 Spanish flu. Um, uh, uh, epidemic. Mm -hmm. And this is because you had a whole health shock that became an economic shock and potentially a shock to the financial, uh, to the financial system. Mm -hmm. And so um, central banks last year were found having to um, discover new things. Uh, the instruments that we had always been used had to be sometimes recalibrated um, they had to be retested. Some of the instruments we had in our toolboxes had not been used for a long time, and we had to use them uh, for, the, uh, for the first time. And as the world gets to, to grips with the impact of this uh, pandemic, there is no doubt that the role that had been played by central banks in uh, helping the global economy weather this storm uh, has been uh, has been significant, and when I look back, mm. I can say proudly that the South African Reserve Bank acted with speed. It acted with scale to uh, smooth the shocks that the South African economy experienced as a result of the COVID nineteen crisis. Yeah, we still, of course, are in the midst of that crisis, Governor. No question about that. Uh, but uh, with the little benefit of hindsight that we have behind us, are there some tools in your toolbox that perhaps you could have used to uh, mitigate the economic impact of uh, the crisis on the South African economy and on the public in general? Well, we deploy tools as appropriate. And we believe that the tools that we have deployed have been the most appropriate tools that could be deployed uh, under uh, the circumstances. We do have other tools, but we do not think that they were appropriate for, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, shock. Are there some tools in your toolbox now that you potentially could be uh, thinking maybe their time ought to come, i.e., uh, the question has always been suggested that uh, perhaps uh, the bank could have been a little bit more creative in the way it responded to the crises and also in the deployment of the tools that it has at its disposal? Well, um, you know, in a way, sometimes you uh, say when you have uh, central bankers, you must keep central banking simple and understandable. Mm -hmm. When you have creative central bankers, uh, sometimes can be a, a little bit of a problem. It's like having creative accountants. You do not want to have creative accountants. Uh, innovative, yes, we had uh, become. Uh, we innovated with the tools that uh, uh, we use, uh, we, had, uh, we had tweaked them. Um, uh, we deployed our repo facilities, which are normally only deployed for like up to seven days. We extended the maturity profile uh, uh, of those. That was refinement. It was something that we hadn't done, uh, we hadn't done uh, before. Uh, the last time we were involved in the bond purchases was prior to uh, the 31st of March, 1998. Uh, last year, when we saw that there was a dysfunctioning in the market, we were able to embark on a bond purchasing program to restore market functionality. And we had to restore market functionality because the way in which our monetary policy is implemented yeah. is that we work on the basis of a collateral. The financial institutions come to the bank, to the discount window, and um, so to say, and what they do is that they access central bank money. Mm. And if you access central bank money, you should have collateral. Sure. And with a dysfunctioning financial market, it was difficult to determine what the value of the collateral is. And if you do not know what the value of the collateral is, mm. it means that your implementation framework cannot function properly. Yeah. And it is for that reason that we embarked on the bond purchasing 
program to get market functionality back yeah. so that there could be adequate price discovery in the uh, uh, in the South African uh, the South African bond market. Yeah. Something that we had never done mm. uh, before was that we ended up having to come in and support the treasury on its loan guarantee uh, scheme. We were the administrator. It is the risk is with the national treasury. Okay. Um, the world over, there are a number of central banks that had embarked on this uh, I think, but they were all measures that were taken as temporary measures to deal with the crisis. Absolutely. So a lot of work are certainly under the bridge. As you mentioned, Governor, you're also celebrating 21 years of uh, inflation uh, targeting. And uh, I came across a reporter from uh, Peter Tad Montalto, no doubt a gentleman that you know very well, talking about the possibility and the possibleness of uh, re-looking that inflation targeting framework. Is that a discussion that has begun? begun? Are you able to give us any sort of time frames in terms of which that conversation, if it, it is taking place, uh, is uh, going to be done over? Uh, I've read uh, Peter's uh, thing. It is more a revision of the target rather than of the framework, right. because it's basically accepted that the framework is a, a very robust uh, framework. Um, we haven't started the discussions within the central bank uh, uh, itself, um, but I did have the benefit of engagement with the Treasury that I am told that as part of the macro review, one of the things that they want to look at is to relook at the uh, at the target. This target was introduced 21 years ago as three to 6%. Mm. Uh, a year after it had been put in place, it was revised from three to 6% to three to 5%. We experienced a shock in 2001. And as a result of that shock, uh, Minister Manuel and Governor Mboweli decided that uh, they should Revis they should revert back to the three to six target. Um, and that at an appropriate time, they will revise the target back to three uh, to five. If you are to ask me what the policy mistake of the time was, yeah. that was the policy mistake. I think the correct thing to do should have been to keep the target the same and then say, it will take us longer to achieve the target rather than changing uh, the target. Because what it did, the changing of the target was that it then got the people to think that every time there is a shock, you will just press the escape clause and revise the target, yeah. uh, the target uh, higher. That actually resulted in a situation where inflation expectations in South Africa got anchored towards the upper end of that inflation yeah. uh, targeting range. Yeah. What um, uh, the pub general public does not know was that Minister Manuel and Mboweni also had an advice from the staff at the time to say that after the three to five target, we must move towards the two to four uh, percent target, but that the two to four target must not be announced until the three to five target had been uh, anchored uh, adequately uh, in the system. Yeah. So since the inflation targeting was uh, adopted, we, I said we were the 13th country, yeah. Other central banks uh, did adopt their inflation uh, targets. Many of them did revise their targets. Most of them, with the exception of very few, yeah. most of them revised their targets lower. And if there is to be a revision of the targets of, in our inflation targeting framework, this can only be lower, not higher. Yeah. Uh, Governor, I wonder if I can uh, speak to you in confidence, and I laugh at that, of course, as even as I make the suggestion, uh, to ask for your personal thoughts if you were to be asked in which direction uh, the uh, next target could well be. I said to you that the, if the target has to be revised, it can't be revised higher. It can only be revised lower. And the reason it can only be revised lower is, one, globally, inflation structurally had moved lower. Mm -hmm. Two, our own inflation structurally has moved lower and that even when it shoots up, mm -hmm. the peak is lower than in previous peaks. Sure. Three, our emerging market peers that we compete with yeah. have got their inflation targets lower than where we are. And with that, for us to remain competitive, we have got to bring our inflation target closer to where those other emerging market uh, central banks are. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that is no one was higher. Yeah. Another day when we have more time, Governor, uh, I would love to uh, engage you on the issue of uh, whether a uh, moving lower is appropriate. You know, the usual argument about whether, you know, that kind of inflation target is appropriate for an emerging market economy and a growing economy. But let's park it today. Today, I want to focus on another thing. One of the big debates around uh, uh, inflation uh, targeting uh, has been around the mandate of the bank. Uh, some people suggesting that it's better to widen it along the lines of the U.S. Federal Reserve. You have come out in opposition to that. Um, but, Governor, given the success of the bank over the years, over the hundred years, and the very strong institution and good name that it now has in the market, what would be wrong with giving you more powers so that you are able to execute that mandate as well and move the South African economy in the right direction? And underline that you said more powers, uh, and, uh, and and I wish one would have more powers. Let me uh, be this way. People refer to the U.S. Fed, yes. and you know what? The U.S. Fed has this thing. People call it a dual mandate. It's actually not a dual mandate. The, 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 the Federal Reserve Bank law says that uh, they must have uh, full employment, low inflation, and low long-term bond yields. Uh, nobody talked about the low long-term bond yields, but the low long-term bond yields in a way are, in, is embed, uh, is, are embedded in the uh, uh, inflation uh, figure itself. I think institutions are created for a purpose. And if they succeed in their purpose, they must be allowed to continue to succeed in that purpose. If you load them, with a lot more objectives and they do not have the tools to do, to do so, you will set them up to fail. Now, we have been given an additional mandate of financial stability. Yes. And we were given the mandate of financial stability because we were already supervising the bank and now we are also supervising the insurance. And so we have got the regulatory tools to pursue financial stability. We have got the regulatory tools to prudentially regulate banks and regulate financial market infrastructures and regulate the insurers. Mm. When you say that you are giving us the responsibility for financial market stability, we have got the tools to do so because that's where we operate. We operate in the financial market. Sure. And when the financial legislation is changed, the Reserve Bank has a say in the changing of the financial market legislation. Right. If you were to give us, for example, an employment mandate and an employment target, would you give us a say over labor markets? That when you change the labor laws, you will ask us that, what do we have to say about the labor laws? Because they play a role in, uh, uh, in that space. Yeah. And whether you think that our un unemployment problem is a cyclical problem or a structural, a structural problem. And I can say to you, even when this economy was booming and growing by five and a half percent, we only managed to bring down unemployment to around 23%. Yeah. That tells you that there are fundamental structural faults in this economy that unless addressed, we will not be able to correct the unemployment, uh, unemployment problem. So taking that responsibility and placing it with a central bank is not going to, uh, 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 is not going to correct it. That as it may, the constitution has given us a price stability mandate which is in the interest of balance and sustainable growth. Understand that a central bank does have an influence on growth, yeah. but it is only growth, what we call cyclical growth, which is really short-term growth, growth over 12, 18 to 24 months, but nothing on structural growth. A central bank now, as the economies are growing and are espousing the fourth industrial revolution, for example, yeah. we will not be able to produce the engineers, the scientists, and all of those for us to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. The education system must have those outcomes yeah. on the education front to be able to take advantage of that space. And that will be our reluctance yeah. in uh, putting so much 
uh, with a central bank. And given that we have to act independently, yeah. I am not even sure that if we are given the responsibilities that uh, the ones you have talked about, yeah. that we will be given the space to act independently with respect to this.